Funding for Louisiana Legends is brought to you by Roy O. Martin, known for its honesty, excellence, stewardship, and respect for the land. A devotion to these values has allowed Roy O. Martin to celebrate 90 years building a better Louisiana. And Louisiana Healthcare Connections, dedicated to delivering quality health care throughout Louisiana. Get healthy and stay healthy for you, your family, your health. Additional funding is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. By the end of her first decade in life, Mary Gallagher Fry had traveled with her parents, Willie May and Fred C. Fry, to and from Minnesota, where the major received his PhD in sociology. Coming back to Louisiana, he joined the faculty at LSU and spent 40 years dedicated to the school, even gaining the moniker of Mr. LSU. The major was quite a humanist, her dad. Remember, he was a sociologist and he was far ahead of his time in terms of human relations. And uh, Mary uh, inherited that from him, uh, and uh, she has exhibited those same qualities. Mary came from energetic stock on both sides. By the end of her second decade, Mary had already begun LSU and met the man she was to marry, L.W. Puna Eaton. They were both active in campus life and she is still committed to the university she loves so much. After the end of World War II and graduating from LSU, Mary married Puna, and they began their life together. He the handsome businessman, and she the great beauty by his side, the epitome of the power couple. Through the 1950s and 60s, by the end of her fourth decade, having five children and supporting her husband's political service, Mary was already serving her community. I don't know that Mother was ever a stay-at-home mother. <laughs> she um, uh, was always with the community. But what her rule was at 3 o'clock, when the children got off school, out of school, should I say, she was there for them. She is probably the most dedicated um, person to her community that I've seen or had the opportunity to work with. And that, uh, to me, tells you a lot about her as a person. She is totally dedicated to what happens to bad mood. Then came the 1970s, when Puna died suddenly, and she was a widow at only 52. That's when the widow group started. She said she would wait an appropriate amount of time when someone was widowed and call them and said, OK, you've got to go on with life. You cannot sit in the house. Now we're going to the symphony on Thursday night, and we've got this on Friday night, and you're coming with us. But Mary wasn't content with supporting her community as president or founding member of organizations from the Junior League to the Women's Council of Baton Rouge. She wanted to tackle yet another role. She was 60 or 61 when she ran for office and just felt that there was a need at that point in time. She has really been on the forefront of so many issues, regardless of your race, regardless of your income. Uh, if you were poor, guess what? she would find a way to feed you. If there was something that you needed, uh, she would find a way to help get somebody to help you out. But more than that, uh, there is not anything hardly you could point to in Baton Rouge and surrounding areas that Mary Fry Eaton has not had a hand in. I would say she's more like a, a velvet glove type lady. Soft-spoken, but uh, persistent consistent, knows the difference between right and wrong, and always tries to do the right thing, but in a gentle way, but a firm way. Mother had the wonderful ability of taking her Amy Vanderbilt rule of etiquette and wrapping it around her sledgehammer. In a facet of her life, in a phase of her life, you would see she was always there working to better the community. So she lived the part. So now what? As she approaches her ninth decade, just as Mary commits herself to her beloved Baton Rouge and her children do the same, the newest generation, her granddaughter Elizabeth, 
has become involved in the Community Fund for the Arts, the same organization for which Mary served as the first president. Mary Fry Eaton, mother Mary to many, a force to be reckoned with and a true Louisiana legend. Hello and welcome to LPB's Louisiana Legends. I'm Beth Courtney and you've just seen a short bio of Mary Fry Eaton. We're fortunate to be with Mary now in her lovely Baton Rouge home. And Mary, thank you so very much for letting us be in your home. You're welcome. Well, you have often off opened it to other people, have you not, through the years? Well, that's what it's for. <laughs> when we built it, that's what my husband said. This is a house to share. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. We're going to talk a little bit about today about uh, your fascinating and wonderful life. And I've had the pleasure of knowing you for many years, but I didn't know you when you were first a little girl. Where did you live? Well, when I was born, we were living on the old campus. Oh, that's where the capital is now. The new, LSU's old where campus. the new capital is. That's where LSU was. And we uh, we lived up over that pump station. There was, it's up on a bluff, and we overlooked the Lady of the Lake Hospital. Well, your father was so intimately involved with the campus, was he not? Right. In many capacities. Right, right. He taught on both campuses for a while. They were still having classes up there where the capital is now, and they were having classes out on the new campus that was way out Highland Road. Well, um, so I remember Major Fry, your, your, your dad, um, was quite uh, a, an institution uh, on that campus. He was a, a, a very formidable force when I was there as well, was he not? Well, he, he was called Major Fry because he came home after World War I, came back to school, and he was a good bit older by then. He had had not had an opportunity to start to school even in the country till he was older. So when he got back, he uh, they put him in charge of uh, drilling the troops, drilling the ROTC, and that's where he got that major that stuck with him so long. Well, when your dad was so active on the campus, is that when you really formed a particular love for LSU? Because you really have loved LSU through the years. Or was it during your time on the campus? Oh no, when I was born. <laughs> right. I was born on the old campus. Right, so that's your first occasion. Well, I did, wasn't born on it, but we were living there. Right. Well, tell me about uh, your high school time in Baton Rouge. You went to Baton Rouge High? I did. Mm -hmm. And I always imagine you were a big woman on campus uh, at high school as well as in college. I know you were president of the sorority on the LSU campus, right? Yeah. That's correct. You have to, I have to think. <laughs> That's yes. true, remember. Yes, yes. But you were also a very um, a, a good student, and I think that um, when you're looking back on um, your college years, what, what do you remember the most? Was it meeting Puna or was it studying? <laughs> oh, I met him before I got to college. I see. <laughs> In Griffin's Drugstore. In Griffin's Drugstore. How old were you? This is your husband. He, I was 15. You he met was 15. 17. Goodness gracious. Well, what was that like? Was that out of bolt out of the blue? Yes, because... At that point, he was probably the handsomest boy in town. He came in the drugstore, and I was in there with a boy named, um, his name was Onion Pennington, but it was, uh, we called him Onion, but let's see, Claude. I mean, you know, they're very, I mean, he's become well known. <laughs> Since, Pennington, yes. Yeah, Claude mm -hmm. Pennington is mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. a recognized name now. He and Onion Pennington uh, rode with me to take June Harriman, chef as she is now, out home out to uh, Fairfields. Fairfields was at the entrance to the plant, the plant we called it, the Standard Oil. 
and he and Onion rode back with me, but neither one of them got in the front seat. They both stayed in the back seat. When I got back to Griffin's, I let them out. And that was, uh, well, well I, was in, I was still in high school. So you dated all during college, though? We dated all through college, oh yeah. He called me up that night and told me he didn't know if I was in love with anybody, he didn't know if I was going with anybody, but he wanted me to know that when I grew up, he was gonna marry me. Well, Mary, this was, um, so this was really pre-World War II. So oh, what yeah. was Baton Rouge like? Was it a little town during that time? Did you feel like everybody knew one another during that period? It's, it's a big city now. Yeah. No, everybody didn't know everybody, but my daddy had a green Dodge. <laughs> and uh, I could take the car to school, which was really something. I'd drop him at LSU at 8 o'clock. I had to be sitting in front of his office at 5 o'clock. But I had the car the rest of the day. So. Fifteen years old, and you're driving around town. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's pretty. Wherever <laughs> I wanted to, to uh, he let me use the car that I, uh, the, as well as I remember. I was allowed to take it out to Baton Rouge Child with me, to sell uh, ads to the fricassee. The fricassee was the yearbook. I see. That's an odd thing for yearbook, isn't it? It is. It is. Fricassee. All right. So you're driving around town in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Its population is not what it is these days. What were the roads like? Were, they, uh, were there a lot of like dirt roads and things, or was everything paved, you know? Well, they were pretty much paved by then. I'm trying to remember. No, I don't remember dirt roads. I think well, I'm asking paint. you these things because, you know, interestingly, late in, later on in your life, you became the mayor pro tem of East Baton Rouge Parish. And over your lifespan, you had to worry then, as mayor pro tem, about infrastructure, about roads and sewage and the growth of Baton Rouge. Did you ever think when you were 15 driving around that you'd be mayor pro tem? I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> you didn't? I don't even think we called it that then, but no, no. You never envisioned that? No. Well, what did you think uh, when you were in high school, at Baton Rouge High School, what did you imagine you were going to be when you grew up? What did you want to do? I don't remember even thinking about that. I kind of took things as they came. Well, that's a good that's a good way of looking forward to things. So you as they came along, you naturally then went on to LSU to school. Yeah, yeah, I went to LSU. And uh, now I never thought about what I was going to do or be or What did you major in at LSU? Do you remember that? You idea? would ask me. It was history. Ah. That's what I majored in, too. <laughs> but um, Harry Williams was my professor. T. Harry Williams, T. the famous Harry Williams. history professor. Oh, he became so famous. <laughs> yes. But he and uh, asked me to be his uh, assistant, I think. I guess that's what they called right. us. And I worked for him as long as... I was there and he was there. Well, that's exciting. I didn't realize it that. It was. What a, he was so much fun as a professor that people used to bring dates to his class to hear his lectures about the Civil War. Uh, Do you remember how compelling those were? They were just extraordinary. He, he was uh, excellent. And he won a Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Huey Long. He so, sure did. I forgot that's a that. that's a wonderful thing. Hmm. What were LSU football games like when you were on campus? Did women get all dressed up and have corsages and? There was a time when we did. Right. We uh, yes. I'm trying to think in period of my life when all that happened, 
But yes, we used to get dressed to the nines to go to the football games. When did you all move to Jefferson Place? Do you remember around? 54. In 54. Thanksgiving of 54. Thank, so you've been here a good time. You've seen a lot come and go. You, and you, in this house, you had five children. Right. So you must have been awfully busy. Now he was doing real estate and construction and everything, and you were keeping up with five children. And then he also had a career in politics, did he not? Well, remember, he was a Marine. So, as but he had, he was a Marine at, he went, went through Paris Island and then, as he said, when he got out at, through in Paris Island, that's where Marines get their training, in case you say basic. That's right. He said when he set foot back on the, that, off that island, he really wasn't sure he was still a human being. Mm. It was quite an experience. And then he went on to Quantico. And, uh, so did he serve overseas in World War II? No, he did. Where, where was he? Japan. In Japan. Ah, OK. No, where was he first? Okinawa. Excuse me, Okinawa. So he was in Okinawa. And then Japan, occupied Japan. But he was, he did, did occupy Japan. So were you anxious during that period of time, I would imagine, waiting for letters and to come back? Well, the whole time that we had an identity with each other was, I was always waiting. He was somewhere, <laughs> you were always waiting. somewhere else. Well, he must have been here enough for you to have five children, though. <laughs> yeah, he'd drop by occasionally. He'd drop by occasionally. So after the war, you're here, you move into this wonderful subdivision, you have this beautiful home, five children. Well, you Once again, you're driving the car. That 15-year-old driving around town must have come in handy because you spend a lot of time driving a station wagon, I hear. Yeah. That's interesting. Yes, I did. You did. You did indeed. Was that a time when you were also like in the junior league and doing community activities, volunteer work too? Well, yes. <laughs> I was uh, active in, in the Methodist Church. I was president of the at U University Methodist, president of, and then I was the district Christian social relations. Uh, chairman, I guess you'd say, of uh, the Methodist Methodist women. I did that for eight years. So I kind of did a lot of all that. And so looking in, in Baton Rouge right now, there are a lot of wonderful institutions that I know you've been involved in. The Arts and Science Center Museum, the Speech and Hearing, that now has even opened up a new uh, center. Um, so, is there really um, a sense of satisfaction of knowing that you help be there on the ground floor of some of these things? You know, I look at like Magnolia Mound and I think it would have been torn down if people like you weren't involved. Well, I, I, it just never occurred to me not to. <laughs> you just you know, sort of did what you were supposed to do. When, when it became... Uh, evident that something needed doing, we did it. So, all right, so now we've talked about, so you've had all these children, and you're active in the community, you're driving around town doing us, and your husband also is in the Louisiana legislature. Yeah. He is a state senator. He is. What, and, you know, notoriously in that time, the legislature was had all kinds of things going on. It was the people, lobbyists, you know, throwing chicken bones on the floor or something. Was that, when you went down to the Capitol, was that a shock to you? I don't think anything's ever been a shock. You just accept things as they happen. Well, and at that point, did you get to know some new people that you perhaps didn't know from around the state? Yes. Yeah, what was that, what was that like? Well, any other experience, it's a, it's an opportunity 
because the the more people you meet, the more interesting your life becomes. We had one that um, we told him he he sat near Puna at the in the Senate, and uh, he couldn't understand what we people call him Puna Puna. Well, you know it's P U N A. And what does that stand for? Tell us. Nobody knows. He doesn't know. He said a little girl wrote it on the blackboard in the fourth grade, and she spelled it P-U-N-A. So that's what it was the rest of his life. L.W. Eaton, Puna. And in, in Louisiana politics, it's nice to have a nickname. <laughs> well, this, this is one that not many people <laughs> forgot. It, but th there was one of them that sat near him in the Senate, and he called him uh, Charlie the Tuna. He called him Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's yeah. funny. So did you enjoy that time? You, camp you helped him in campaigning. Did all the children help in the campaign, too? Yes. <laughs> all the children helped. Everyone well, of course. It, you know, that was... That's how it all worked. It was a family business, as well right. as other things. And one of the things that um, I guess I so admire about you is I know at a very young age, really, you, you were widowed and you just carried on. You had to carry on. Puna died unexpectedly. And you were a very young age. Oh, yes. and, that was a, and that was a tough time then, wasn't it? Was. It? it was because he just dropped dead. Yeah. And so really carrying on. His heart just burst. And they dropped dead. So one of the things um, you did uh, that was so interesting that a lot of women haven't done uh, is decide that you were going to, at, at I think around 55, that you were going to run for political office. What prompted that? Now, you've been involved in politics with your husband. Well, yes, that's a, that's a responsibility of citizenship. You should participate in politics. Politics is what makes it all happen. So you have an obligation to be involved. So you believe in the whole concept of a public servant, and that's yes, part of, de of democracy. Yes, yes that's, that's an obligation of citizenship. So there are a lot, of, a lot of women these days who aren't running for office in Louisiana. We have the smallest percentage of women in elected office of any state. Did you realize that? That's an no. interesting no, phenomenon. No, and I'm ashamed. Well, you, what you've done, though, is you, you've encouraged people to be involved in the process. And yeah. I remember that when you were elected to the city council, that you really, I know, worked very hard to bring people together. Wasn't, didn't you want to find consensus? Was that one of the things that you worked on? Well, I'm sure it was because that's kind of what life's all about. <laughs> Having people get along together. You, you have to work at making things work. When you served as Mayor Pro Tem, is there anything you're especially proud of during that time of service? How about uh, the downtown? It's changed so much since when you were young. Well, of course, I think it's very important, and I did then, and I still do, try to be as supportive as I can. So at the same time that you were doing all of that, though, as a widow, the thing that I loved was that you were so eager to embrace life. You used to pick up a group of ladies and take them to all kinds of events. T tell me about that, to sporting events and symphonies and things like that. The widows. The widows. <laughs> Who were they? Well, gosh, I haven't thought about it. Stell Williams, I remember particularly. Stell was a good bit older than I was, and uh, she taught at LSU. That's T. Harry Williams' wife. T. Harry Williams' wife, and she taught English. She was in the English department. And I had majored in history and minored in English. But, but beyond that, we were just a group friends of friends because the university 
particularly arts and science, was small enough that so All this, of us knew each other. So this, uh, yeah, this group of ladies, though, did you take them to baseball games? I think you were there. I hear you were there at every. <laughs> we, uh, we, the widows. We, we didn't miss much. We, we went on trips together. We went to baseball games together. I remember some. We were at one point. They all got to talking about baseball, and I said. Well, you want to go? Well, yeah. And I said, well, I know where the ticket office is. I'll go buy some tickets. Well, you know, Mary, it's such a joy always to see you. I said, you have a wonderful technique that I think we should all adopt. And that is when you see somebody, now you go, let's stick out your hand, you would go, hi, I'm Mary Fry Eaton. And then they would have to tell you their name, right? <laughs> Is that well, a good technique? <laughs> well, it's one way to find out. <laughs> what their name is. If they're polite enough to tell you. Good manners are something that we should all teach the Ma next generation, Manners right? are very important. You're so pretty, and you're a beautiful woman today. You're a beauty on campus. You're a lovely person. <laughs> Why didn't you, did you ever, de did you ever decide to date? Why didn't you, did you ever date again after your husband died? Not really. Why not? Well, I'm not interested. <laughs> I've had it all. Okay. Nobody's going to replace him. Mm -hmm. well, that's a sweet one. Unless you can think of somebody. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you can think of somebody, I might consider. But I doubt it. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for inviting us into your home. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I always love visiting with you. And thank you for joining us for this interview with the remarkable woman, Mary Fry, Eaton, the original golden girl. Thank you so much. On the behalf of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Beth Courtney. Good evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Funding for Louisiana Legends is brought to you by Roy O. Martin, known for its honesty, excellence, stewardship, and respect for the land. A devotion to these values has allowed Roy O. Martin to celebrate 90 years building a better Louisiana. And... Louisiana Healthcare Connections, dedicated to delivering quality health care throughout Louisiana. Get healthy and stay healthy for you, your family, your health. Additional funding is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.